Dexter, Dexter Vincent, <coughs> he's been to the Middle East many, many times. He reports for camera on Christian affairs, Christian media. Um, and again, more details are in the program. Dexter, please. Professor Resnikoff for convening this. I think this your mic night. needs a. Okay. You need some light, then. I think it's all right. It's all right. All right. I'm going to have to pretend I'm Mick Jagger. It's not on. Oh, it's not it's on. on. Well, it's well then Roger Daltrey, I guess. It's on. It's on. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's all right. I want to thank Professor Resnikoff for convening this event, uh, Dean Rosada for her kind welcome. <coughs> and uh, Lauren Asula for doing a lot of the logistical uh, footwork, and I also want to thank everyone for attending this conference. And uh, I'm also honored to be numbered among the speakers at this conference. And I think one of the underlying questions that I'm expected to answer, or at least try to address today, is whether or not the United States or the West, and I don't mean to use scare quotes, but doubt quotes. I'm not sure that the West exists the way they used to talk about it or think about it, but whatever is left of the West uh, we'll be able to muster the, uh, the strength necessary to come to the aid of beleaguered people in um, Muslim-majority countries in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world, and live up to the moral requirement to protect and rescue the innocent that adheres to the phrase, never again, that we have uttered so many times in the years since the Holocaust. Uh, and and uh, kind of telling tales out of school, but prior to this event, the speakers had a conference call, and there was some debate amongst us over whether or not we should help the Christians in the Middle East stay where they are, whether or not we should help evacuate them. And I honestly don't know the answer to that question. And it may not be an either or issue, but it's one of those both and questions. And uh, <coughs> regardless of the disagreements that we have, I think the working assumption that all of us here today have, uh, and some people in this room may disagree with it, uh, given the American involvement in the Middle East, and I think that, but uh, is it by virtue of our role in world politics, the United States has an obligation to play a leading role in responding to the genocide against Christians and Yazidis in Iraq and Syria, and also to do more to protect the rights of people, uh, other minority people groups such as the Baha'i in Iran and the Coptic Christians in Egypt. And we may not agree on what to do, but we do feel that the U.S., and other Western powers should be at the forefront of responding to the crisis before us. And one of the reasons why, I think, is because we helped to create it. I want to make that absolutely clear. With the invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, and I was one of those people that thought that the ouster of Saddam Hussein was the best thing that would ever happen, and it turned out to be a fundamental disaster, and it's one of the things that has bothered me ever since, and I have repented of my support for that, for that invasion. Uh, but it's done. I don't really know what else to tell you. Now, in previous talks, I would catalog the obstacles that prevented us from responding to the genocide before us. And as some, I would ask, well, you know, what is stopping us from doing more? And I'd recount the obstacles that we, would face, that we faced. And then I would make some bland or vague assessment about what we need to do and what needs to be done. And what happened was is that when I recounted all of these things, um, I basically, I was wondering if I, I was leaving people with a sense of hopelessness, and it weakened me. And I think it probably even weakened the, uh, my, my audiences. And one of the interesting things uh, is, is that at a certain point, one of the, the people that I worked with in Boston came up to me and says, well, Dexter, what, what are the Christians doing? What can you do to, uh, to really actually promote some interest or concern over what's going on with the Christians in the Middle East? Uh, and I said, well, you know, it's probably going to take another mass killing of Christians uh, to actually really get them interested in it. And uh, this guy, he's probably about in his 60s or 70s, he was about ready to strangle me. He was, he was about ready to grab me by the throat. He put his finger in my face and he says, that's to the whole point of this is to basically just make sure that the next mass killing doesn't take place. And uh, I, I guess. So I, what has happened is, is that uh, over the past few months, I've actually kind of become a little bit more theological in my approach, which is kind of odd because here I am in a law school. Uh, but I started to think seriously about, you know, curiously, how is it, you know, that essentially, um, how is God going to act? That's really one of the questions that I have been asking, and it's one of those questions that I think that my 
my Christian faith uh, requires of me. It asks me to ask that. How is God going to manifest his merciful will and loving kindness in the face of the genocide we've witnessed? And how is that God, how is that God deputized people and, uh, and empowered them to do his will? And these are risky questions for people to ask. And they're probably out of place to be asking at a law school. And for the people who are religiously minded here, I apologize for presuming to even ask them because I'm just a lay Roman Catholic who converted just a few years ago. Uh, but at the same time, these types of questions are the questions that we ask typically that we look at all of the salvation narratives uh, in the Bible. The stories typically begin with a hopeless predicament, an existential threat to the welfare of the people that God cares about. Uh, and as the story proceeds, God finds his leaders and interviews and intervenes through them on behalf of his people. And sometimes he's manifestly present, like in the book of Exodus, and sometimes you don't see him like in the book of Esther. And oftentimes people he picks really aren't up to the task and say so one way or another, and basically the response he gets that he gives to him is, well, I am with you. And I know that there's probably people here who are irreligious, and I'm still basically summoning you to, uh, regardless of your faith background, into a modern-day salvation narrative. Uh, and as lawyers, you'll be perfectly equipped to deal with an awful lot of the issues that are that are that we're they're contending with. Um, and I, essentially, that's what I think we need to d deal with. Um, and I guess I'm going to kind of deviate from my script because one of the, the, the legal issues that we deal with is the whole issue of dimmy status or dimitude. And I'm going to ask how many people have heard the word dimmy before. Okay, so we got a lot of people. Um, which is a good thing, because there are times, uh, dimmi is derived from the word dimma, which is Arabic for uh, what is most often referred to as a treaty of protection. Uh, and another word, dimitude, has been coined to describe the sociological and historical circumstances endured uh, by non-Muslims in Muslim-majority environments. And it also describes the psychological impact of living in this oppressed non-Muslim in a Muslim-majority society. And Anglican scholar Mark Dury encourages us not to regard the Dima as a treaty of protection, as it's oftentimes presented to people, but as a treaty of liability that places conquered non-Muslims under the threat of violence, and more specifically jihad, should they violate its terms. Uh, and this is a contract, and it's a contract that's actually thrust on non-Muslim populations. It has been historically thrust onto non-Muslim populations, most specifically Christians and Jews. And the terms of this pact uh, which was basically kind of non-negotiable, included a promise not to flee the territory where they lived and again seeking outside help to overturn the pact. And Dimmies who violated the terms agitated and agitated for the equality and freedom forfeited their claim for protection. Now the goal of the Dimma pact was to place non-Muslims into a subservient, humiliated position and to place Muslims into a position of supremacy in the societies where this pact took place. And to that end, Muslim rules established a whole set of rules and laws to circumscribe the lives of non-Muslims. For example, only Muslims were allowed to ride horses. Uh, Anglican scholar Mark Dury, who I mentioned previously, reports that dhimmis were prohibited from any public display of their religion, no crosses, funeral processions, bells, no loud singing, and were not allowed to sell or print Christian books. And in some areas, dimmies were not allowed to wear matching shoes and were required to wear neck rings or bells around their necks to distinguish them from Muslims in the public path. Christians and Jews were not allowed to build or repair their houses of worship and were not allowed to build their private homes higher than that of Muslims. Churches and synagogues were not allowed to stand higher than nearby mosques. A lot of these rules are still in force and still in place uh, in the Middle East in Muslim-majority environments. Uh, and, and what has happened is, is that even in those places, for example, in Egypt, where uh, President Sisi has said, look, we really have to revolutionize the manner in which uh, Islam is practiced in the modern world, Christians are still subjected to accusations and prosecution for uh, blasphemy. And so I, I guess one of the things is that all of these things uh, basically imposed a number of hindrances and burdens on Christians and Jews that were intended to hum humiliate and degrade them as human beings and place Muslims in a superior status. And they also basically were required to pay a jizya, and oftentimes when they collected that jizya, they were required, uh, there was a ritual associated with hitting them around the head or the neck to basically remind them that they were paying for the right uh, to keep their head on their shoulders. 
Now the thing is, is that if I was a law professor, I would, one of the questions that I'm going to ask it anyhow is, is that, and, and is that what happens when, what happens is, what does, what message do these laws give uh, to the people who live under them, uh, and and how are people going to respond to that message when the rule of law collapses? And I think that's one of the things that we have seen. Uh, the state power and state structure in Iraq and Syria has pretty much collapsed. Uh, and what has happened is, is that people have largely uh, uh, acted out on the message that, is, that, that, is, that, 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 that the Sharia law or Sharia has imposed on people's minds. And one of the things that I want to make clear is, is that essentially, uh, you know, and this is a very rough thing to say, but I think over the long haul we're going to have to struggle uh, the one thing that we need to do and we need to be courageous of is to basically struggle with the, uh, the legacy uh, that Muhammad has left on the societies where Islam has basically taken root and, and where it's the dominant religion. Because one of the, th and, and this is a dicey thing for me to say, but I, I think it's true and I think that the circumstances bear it out and I think it needs to be said, which is, is that essentially if you look at the terrible things that are being done uh, uh, to the to Christians, Yazidis, and the Baha'i, uh, and other people in the Middle East and in other parts of the world, essentially, uh, if you look at the biography of Muhammad, if you look at the Hadiths or the sayings of the Prophet, and if you look at the passages in the Quran, uh, essentially, you don't really have to make too hard of a case to justify these actions against these non-Muslims. Uh, that doesn't mean that every Muslim interprets uh, the scripture this way, that doesn't mean that there isn't a way to reinterpret these scriptures, but I think that this is really one of the things that we have to struggle with. Uh, and I think, you know, as a Christian, one of the things that I spent the past 10 years of my life uh, doing is to basically kind of remind people uh, that the New Testament in some instances, you know, encourages hostility towards, towards Jews. There's anti-Judaic passages, and we have to kind of struggle with their legacy. And ultimately, we have to start asking ourselves exactly what type of God is it that we worship? And I think that this is a central question. And this is a question that Christians have had to ask themselves in reference to their relationship with the Jewish people. And I think that this is an issue that's going to take place internally uh, within Islam uh, for the years ahead. Um, and, I, and I am actually somewhat, um, I think one of the things that we need to do is to basically hear more first-hand testimony because uh, uh, from people who have suffered under ISIS and other groups, uh, particularly in Africa and, and, and in, in the Middle East, because what it does is it will help us get beyond a superficial understanding of Islam that is more suited to pleasant as opposed to robust and truthful interfaith dialogue. And uh, what happens is a lot of the times, and I deal a lot with Christian environments, uh, People really don't want to offend uh, Muslim sensibilities by bringing these issues up. Uh, but at the same time, if you're a sincere human rights activist and you're interested in basically protecting the rights of religious and ethnic minorities, these are the things that we have to talk about. Um, and just as uh, Christians have been forced by their own history to look at their own faith through the eyes of the Jews that historically they've oppressed, we're going to have to encourage Muslims to look at their faith uh, and how it is practiced through the eyes of the people who have been oppressed by its practitioners as well. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why hearing the first-hand testimony of people who have lived uh, under these circumstances and who have endured these trials are so important, because what it will do is it will give us uh, the courage, I think, to basically speak more truthfully. That doesn't mean that we should go out of our way to antagonize uh, Muslims, but I think we have to speak truthfully about this. When Jules Isaac, in the 1950s and 60s, he was a European Jew who basically said, he wrote a book called, uh, I can't even remember the name of the book, uh, Teachings of Contempt. Teaching. Yeah. He basically said, look, we've got to deal with this issue. And, and as a Jew, he, he said, look, you know, this is something that Christians need to deal with. I think over the long haul, though, most of the work is going to be have to be done by Muslims themselves. Uh, and fortunately, I am a little bit more optimistic because in early, late January uh, there was a large group of Muslim scholars who met in Marrakesh and they issued the Marrakesh Declaration 
uh, that calls on Muslims to promote an, an ethic of citizenship and respect for the rights of non-Muslim or, or of religious minorities in the countries in which they live. Uh, and clearly there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but as we go forward, um, we have to remember that, uh, that uh, religious people are not their religious texts, okay? You know, it, uh, I am not uh, the anti-Judaic passages that appear in the New Testament, uh, and we are not, and we can't reduce people uh, to the texts in their holy scriptures that frighten us or bother us. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think that we can ignore these texts because people take them very seriously and they have real consequences on how we live. Uh, and I guess um, the type of changes that, uh, that we're going to have to hopefully see within Islam are going to be hugely difficult to bring about. And we know this because of the difficulty that Christianity ha ha has had dealing with some of its issues related to the Jewish people. Um, and I guess... Um, but again, it comes down to what type of God do we worship. And I think that I, I hope that we all worship, worship a loving and merciful God. Um, and I, I think one of the things that all of the Abrahamic faiths do is, is that they worship a God who restrained the blade. And what I mean by that is that when Abraham took his son up to Mount Moriah with the expectation that he was to sacrifice his son, God stayed uh, Abraham's hand. Uh, he restrained the blade. If we ask him, oh, I got eight minutes left, but I'm not going to need it all, so let's get these people some coffee. But uh, if we ask him, I think he can restrain the blade in our hearts and maybe just maybe give us a role to play in restraining this blade in the world that has basically been sovereign all too many times. And the, the question that I ask in hope and curiosity that I wouldn't have asked a few months ago is uh, how is God going to restrain this play today uh, in, in our time? And what role will we, Christian, Muslim, and Jew, play in bringing this about in a time such as this? Thank you.